Okay, this is the part one video of uh, chapter two, section two, Native American cultures discussion. As you know, Native American is not a single group, but a category that refers to dozens and dozens of different tribes that lived in the Americas long before the Europeans came across the Great Water. Native American religion is animistic meaning that they believe in one God who created the world and that everything is connected to God through the spirit world. Animism uses dreams, songs, dances, and visions to connect the spirit world to ask for help or prevent disasters. Each tribe has its own version of the story shaped by their environment and culture. The Great Spirit, or God, was given many names among the different tribes. For instance, the Lakota Indians God was named Wakan Tonka, and to the Iroquois it was Hagawadiaya. The Cherokee people called their god Enakalaniha. Most Native American religions share several things in common, but with their own unique twist. The names and animals change, ba change based on the environment, and this changes the way dances and rituals are performed. Our first group we're going to talk about is the Northeastern Woodlands. Imagine a land thick with trees that stretch for nearly a thousand miles from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean, and from Canada all the way to the Ohio River. The deciduous forages teem with deer and beaver, wild turkey, fox, rabbit, and a whole lot of other furry animals that allow the people to thrive in these woods. Pigeons were, pigeons were said to be so thick and when a flock flew overhead, they darkened the sky. The many groups who live here are split into two various other groups who call themselves the, the Fox or the Soy, the Sauk or the Potawatoma or the Mohawk, just to name a few. These people would one day be divided by historians into two groups based on which language they spoke. The Algonquin people lived in New England while the Iroquoian people lived in Quebec, Ontario, and in New York. Take a second to picture your home. Think about all the stuff you use every day, how to get there. I can bet that most of the items you see and use every day was not homegrown or handmade by members of your family, but they had to be imported from a foreign place. Every Indian village was its own department store. Men and women, yes, even the kids worked too. Men and women had their own specific task and the whole community produced what it needed. Men taught their sons how to hunt with bows and arrows, fish with nets and spears, and clear the undergrowth of the forest by setting controlled fires. To clear the forest, they used a special technique called girdling, where a large ring of bark is stripped from the tree, which slowly kills it. In a few years, the trees can be cleared for farming. The women were responsible for tending the fields, growing maize, also known as corn, squash, pumpkins, and beans. Many of these crops went into a dish called succotash, which was a popular meal for these Native American groups. The Indians had a way of fertilizing their crops by placing fish in the hole along with the seed. They, thought this they taught this technique to the Europeans which were clueless about the way, how to farm in this new environment. Few things went to waste, which makes sense when you have to spend hours making everything from scratch. Animals were used for their meat, of course, but the fur was turned into clothing or blankets. The skin was used for carrying water or to rainproof the house. The bones were fashioned into tools or used for hooks. Even the sinew, or the guts, was put to use as bowstring. From the plants and trees of the forest, women wove baskets and made mats. They kept the fires going and did all of the cooking, the washing, and they cared for the children. The men would carve bone and wood into tools and into weapons. The Algonquins in New England, yes, these are the same people who met the pilgrims in Massachusetts, they have a different style of house than the Iroquois who lived a little bit further east of them. The Algonquin people have constructed a small round structure out of bent sam samplings, twigs, and covered with bark, kind of like a uh, roof shingle. And they call this a wigwam. In the center of the roof is a hole where the fire can escape. Around that fire, a family can stay warm in the winter and dry during the rain. 
A typical Algonquin village had hundreds of these wigwams. And in the corner of the room underneath our little TV next to the uh, bookshelf there, you can see a model that was made of an uh, Algonquin wigwam. The Algonquin's enemies are the fierce Iroquois who live in New York, in the southern part of Canada, and in also in parts of New England as well. These people live a very similar life as the Algonquins except for their homes. They called their homes longhouses that were built uh, kind of like a giant, looked like a giant Twinkie. Of course, it didn't have the cream filling inside. Most of these houses are around 150 feet long, and the longest ever built was around 335 feet, which is about the size of a football field. These long houses house large extended families called clans that included mom and dad, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins, grandparents, all living in one house. Some long houses could house as many as 20 families. The people of the Longhouse called themselves the Haudenosaunee, which translates into the people of the Longhouse. The Algonquins called them the Iroquois, or the Terrible People. This is because the Iroquois had formed a confederation among the five main tribes who lived in Quebec, New York, and Ontario. They were the Mohawk, Oneida, the Onondaga, the Siaga, and the Seneca. And they band together in times of war and as trading partners. And they were the sworn enemy, the Iroquois, were the sworn enemy of the Algonquins. Travel south of the Ohio River and you reach an area cleverly called the Southeastern Woodlands, which today are the states of North and South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Kentucky. The Indians who lived here mostly belonged to a linguistic or a language family called the Muskegon, which included tribes such as the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cree, just to name a few. However, other languages were spoken by some groups as well in this area. During hunting season, men did not dress up in bright orange overalls like hunters in modern times, but used a type of camouflage, spreading dirt on their bodies and wearing deer antlers on their heads to get close enough to shoot without alerting the prey. Because the climate was warmer and wetter, and the soil richer than in New England and New York, the Indians depended more on farming, the same sorts of crops like corn and pumpkin and squash and beans as their neighbors in the north. The women still did the farming, weaving, and caring for the children. Corn was the main staple of their diet, being ground into a mush. They added to stew or made in a hominy, which is a popular southern dish today. The houses in the southeast came in two varieties, winter and summer. Because the weather was so suited for agriculture, the people did not have to move around as much to hunt or gather as other tribes did. The summer homes were rectangular and held up with poles. The outside was coated with mud and clay to keep it cooler in the hot summer months. These structures often were quite large to be able to accommodate an extended family. Most Native American families were matrilineal, which means that the family's uh, line descended from the mother. A typical household consisted of a mother, her children, her parents, and her husband who moved in with the in-laws. The winter homes were smaller and constructed to conserve heat in the cold winter months. These dwellings, called a sai, were often partially dug into the ground and were built in beehive shape like a, with a circular opening in the roof to allow smoke to escape. And the picture you see at the top left is an example. Here's something to chew on. Geography has a huge impact on the way a culture develops. In the areas further to the south, like in the Gulf region of Alabama and Mississippi, the warm subtropical weather gave the Indians plenty to eat without having to work very hard for it. Well, easier than other tribes had it, but still harder work than in ordering a drive through burger or something like that. Groups like the Natchez, for whom the city of Natchez, Mississippi is named after, they had a calendar with 13 months that was based on what foods were available that month. One month would be for strawberries, another for seafood, another told when it was the perfect time to hunt bison. Think of it like our culture revolving around the menu of Burger King.
These cultures had an abundance of food, and like the people of the Northwest, they began to accumulate wealth. This wealth made certain groups better than others, and in Natchez society, three classes emerged. The Natchez chief was called the Great Sun, who had the power of life and earth over his subjects. If anyone offended the Great Sun, that person could be exiled or even killed. The next group were the nobles who were favored by the Great Sun or related to him in some way, kind of like in Mayan society. The last group who did most of the work were the commoners. Because of the environment, some Natchez were able to acquire great wealth and rule over others. Most other societies had a harder time gathering food, and so cooperation and equality was more, more common. 